Good day, I'm Chaplain Jason Unsworth. I'm one of the uh, chaplains serving here at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and I uh, represent the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints community. So it's to that community I'll be uh, addressing my very short remarks today. But before I get into uh, uh, my remarks, uh, I'd like to read a uh, selection from the Gospel of John. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, this is Thomas, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the door was shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen yet who have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing in him, that you might have life in his name. I've often think, uh, thought that Thomas gets a bad rap in Christian thought. To be called a doubting Thomas is not exactly a compliment. As Latter-day Saints and as Christians, as people of faith, we are taught to believe that virtue, is, that that uh, that belief is the virtue and doubt is the vice. And poor Thomas seems to have been named as the patron saint of skeptics, doubters, and disbelievers. The moral of the story seems to be so clear: don't be like Thomas, don't doubt, just believe. I don't know about you or your respective wards, but we don't seem to talk about doubt too much in our church. Rarely in Sunday school or from the pulpit do I hear people give voice to their religious skepticism or anxieties. Maybe they're afraid of how others might uh, react to their doubts. For the believers, dubiousness and uncertainty can frighten us. That's why we, re we reject Thomas. He dares bring doubt into our lives of faith. And I think that's why I'm reluctant to simply dismiss Thomas. I see too much of myself in him. In fact, a while back, a friend of mine, a fellow chaplain, posted one of those uh, tests on Facebook. Which disciple are you? You take the test, you answer a couple of questions, and the results tell you if you're a Peter or a John or whoever. Of course, I'm a, of course I'm a Thomas. And that fits, because like Thomas, belief does not always come easily for me. I like things that I can see and touch. Like Thomas, I have some doubts. I'm a skeptic at heart, and so sometimes the life of faith can be difficult. Like many people of faith, I tried to find a cure for my, my doubts. And so I did what any person of faith would do. I turned to apologetics, academic arguments in support of the existence of God or whatever theological proposition. Because I knew that somewhere out there in the world of apologia had to be the answer to my doubt. There had to be some argument, some logic, some framing or nuance that would make belief in the impossible scriptures, this impossible Christ, rational and sustainable. Apologetics has its uses, but curing my doubt was not one of them. For many, a faith crisis can be a terrifying time. Old comforting beliefs no longer hold any power or meaning. Everything is suspect. It's that dark night of the soul where every proposition is up for grabs. Does God exist? Is Christ resurrected? Or is it all just a fanciful, albeit inspiring myth? Alone we cry in the darkness, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What is the answer to that doubt, that longing uh, for something to hang faith on to? Let's turn back to Thomas, back to our patron saint of the skeptics, and see if he has any answers for us. As we read through God, uh, John's gospel, we realize that Thomas is just not simply some dull-eyed scoffer or disbeliever. When we look closer, we see that Thomas is just a practical, matter-of-a-fact kind of guy. Earlier in the gospel, Thomas insists that the, God, that the disciples accompany Jesus on his journey to Bethany, a place where the promise of a death by stoning seemed certain. Thomas supports Jesus' risky, almost seemingly suicidal plan with, let us also go, that we might die with him. Here we see Thomas as a clear-eyed realist, as well as a man of faith. He knows what the danger is, and he follows Jesus anyways. He shows himself to be loyal and brave. 
Later on in the 14th chapter of the Gospel, as Jesus is offering his farewell discourse, he tells his followers in the poetic, mystical language common to John, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, so where I am, you may also be there. Then you will know the place I am going. Thomas's response, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Though Thomas, like his fellow disciples, does not always understand what Jesus is telling him, he at least is courageous and honest enough to ask his question, to speak up. He's more of a realist than a doubter. And like all of us, he just wants to understand. So it comes no surprise that Thomas has trouble believing the other disciples when they report that glorious news, that Easter message, that Christ is risen. He is resurrected. He wasn't there. He didn't experience it for himself, and just receiving the report from his friends isn't enough. He has to have his own experience. He has to see and touch for himself. And he gets his wish. A week later, the disciples gather together again. This time, Thomas is with them. This time, he sees the risen Christ with his own eyes. He hears and say, hears him say, peace be unto you with his own ears, and he feels the wounds in his hands and side with his own fingers. Do not doubt but believe, Jesus tells him. To which Thomas offers the gospel's climatic confession, my Lord and my God. For Thomas, seeing is believing, but we might not have this option. Not like Thomas, as he stands there in the presence of the risen Lord. So what do we do? Do we abandon ourselves to doubt, suspecting anything and everything that might bring light and truth to our lives? I don't think so. It doesn't have to be that way. In the sixth chapter of John, the disciples ask Jesus how they can better follow him, what, they can, what works they can do to accomplish the will of God. They remember the Old Testament story of how God provided manna, bread from heaven, to sustain the Israelites in their travels and trials. And Jesus tells them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus is the bread. But we have to take him in. We have to metabolize him, accept his grace, let him in to see the change that can happen to our lives. It's almost an experiment. If you don't believe in me, try. Try me and see, says the Lord. So if you're sometimes like Thomas or me, a skeptic, or sometimes a, um, have a person that has doubts, try it as an experiment. Follow Jesus. Live as he did, serving others, loving them, glorifying God, and see if faith doesn't build in you. Faith that comes not just from believing what somebody told you, not just from what you read in a book, but faith that comes from trying Jesus um, by taking up his offer of a new life. Try it and see. Speaking to those who sometimes find themselves in doubt, Elder Uchtdorf once said, doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. And Elder Uchtdorf is not rejecting the validity of your doubts, but he is reminding you and me that there is more to the life of faith than just our doubts. And we should not uncritically abandon ourselves to our doubts and our questions. We may have our doubts, our skeptical attitudes, but Jesus and Elder Uchtdorf invite us to try the experiment in the hope of faith. Try the bread of life that Jesus offers you. Follow him and seek to live as he did. Did anything change? How does the bread of life taste? Does it taste good? Does it bring nourishment and light to your life? Speaking of true doctrine, Joseph Smith once wrote, This is good doctrine. It tastes good. I can taste the principles of eternal life, and so can you. They are given to me by the revelations of Jesus Christ. And I know that when I tell you the words of eternal life as they are given unto me, you can taste them. And, you, and I know that you will believe them. You say, honey is sweet. And so do I. I can also taste the spirit of eternal life. I know it is good. And when I tell you these things, which were given to me by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you are bound to receive them as sweet and rejoice more and more. Good doctrine tastes good. A life of discipleship tastes good. It produces good fruit in our lives. And maybe that's enough, or at least it's a place to start, a place to build from. Not every question can be answered in this life. Some doubts may linger and remain. But the fruit of discipleship tastes good. The bread of life is delicious and life-changing. Try it and see. Brothers and sisters, I hope in moments in doubt and disbelief, you will turn to the bread of life, Jesus himself. Take him into your heart, your mind, your life, and most importantly, 
take him into your actions, how you live in this world, and see if that it doesn't spark goodness, truth in your life, delicious to the taste. This I offer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.